three, four. Do you hear at the end? Do you hear at the end? Raise your hand if you hear at the end. Great. So welcome to this incredible panel. Uh, I'm really proud to be here with these incredible speakers from Football Club Barcelona and Slayer Red Points, ASICS. You know us already because our names and companies are there, but what about you? So we want to learn more who is in the room. So how many entrepreneurs are in the room? Please raise your hand. Wow, a lot. How many investors are in the room? Please, entrepreneurs, look those hands. How many corporates are in the room? Please, investors and entrepreneurs, look to those hands. Others? Great. So I'm director, uh, executive director at YES and also expert on corporate venture at the European Commission and at the World Economic Forum. We are talking a lot, a lot about corporate venture, but what's corporate venturing? So we, design, we define a corporate venture and any collaboration between an established corporation and innovative startup, as we discussed in our recent article at Harrow Business Review, a phenomenon that has dramatically changed all the sectors. If you check, for instance, the 4500 uh, on 2000, half of those companies has either disappeared or changed dramatically their business models. But we have some news here. And I would like to start with this one. For you, we have started to see some news uh, about Tokyo, about the Olympics, and also a recent collaboration with a new tech technology for shoes. Would you mind to share a, a bit for, for the audience? Yes, for sure. So on this slide, we can see uh, NFF. Uh, it's a startup from Japan we're co actually collaborating with right now. We just came back from our demo tour uh, where we invited uh, Yuya, who is the founder of this startup, to present together with the startups that we have in our own acceleration program here in Barcelona, the 10 Con 10 uh, program. Um, we showed the, them to investors. This startup right now, as you can already see on the picture, is uh, how we see the future of running and running analysis. So it's an intelligent shoe. It's a, a prototype that here we presented at the CES in, in Las Vegas. And uh, this is exactly how we bring innovation to ASICS. So we have our Institute of Sports Science. It works together with external entrepreneurs. And we are in Barcelona have our 10 Con 10 uh, accelerator that also nurtures this ecosystem. And I have seen that there are many other collaborations in the room. Albert, for instance, in the next slide, uh, we have seen in the news how this Chills startup blockchain company that you are collaborating with. The other day, I got impressed when uh, Marta Plana was explaining in Israel how uh, BHAB has done 70 research projects, co-developing eight projects with the startups, and so many students working in so many projects. My question is, what are the challenges when working with those startups. Any recommendations for the audience, both for startups and for corporates in those type of collaborations? That's, a, that's the perfectly the key thing, right? So how you manage you know, the flexibility of a startup and the forward-looking kind of expertises that they are developing with you know, the inertious momentums that you gather, you, had, uh, you have in your corporation, right? So in our case, for, for me, or my experience is let's have um, all the corporate business lines kind of align with your innovation uh, strategy. And this is a lot of persuading and a lot of storytelling internally, a lot of um, you know defining what are the main challenges. And I would say even bringing people from the business lines into your innovation departments. Kind of having, you know, you have marketing partners. Let's try to have also innovation partners inside the company. And then, uh, you know, define what are the challenges for today. What are the challenges for five years from now and from 10 years from now? And let's try to manage and have accountability from a uh, corporate perspective. From the startup standpoint, let's try, let's uh, approach the corporates, find the right people to talk, understand what are the key needs for today, five years from now, and 10 years from now, and adapt your pitch to uh, those specific uh, characteristics. We're doing, we are doing recommendations for startups, but may, sometimes in those panels there are no startups. However, today we have a Laura that is an incredible entrepreneur that has multiplied by 30 her startup in a few years. Would you mind to share to the audience what have been the secrets for that tremendous growth? And do you agree with the corporates uh, when they recommend all that stuff? Uh, so 
If I have to pick up uh, um, what uh, what one element of what is uh, that that has drove us to success, I will say focus, and uh, probably only focus. Since the very beginning, we had very clear our mission, what we wanted to be in the coming years, and with this idea, we never. I mean, we followed our our path. And uh, we were not distracted by other possibilities. Uh, we thought that we wanted to be global since the very beginning. So, uh, for instance, our first fundraising it was with a global VC, not a local VC or a Spanish uh, a Spanish uh, VC, because I knew that that was going to be relevant for us in order to gain visibility in the world. Uh, that, that is an example. So, focus has been our driver. Uh, for me. Uh, at the beginning of a startup, in the first years, it's very difficult to work with a corporate. Why? Because uh, a startup has to run. It has to have sense of urgency. I usually say that uh, uh, in red points, one day is like a week, a week is like a month, and a month is like a year. And in a startup, a day is a day, a week is a week. I mean, in a, in a corporate, a day is a day, a week is a week, and a month is a month. So uh, as a result, the rhythms are very different. And a startup can't wait. It has to run. So in the first years, it's very difficult for a startup to work with a stable corporate or a really big corporate. Maybe in the coming years when already uh, you have a size, you have uh, uh, some revenues, you have more team, a bigger, a bigger team, then you can afford to work with a corporate. But I really know some cases, sad cases of a startup that have died just waiting for, for a corporate to answer. You are seeing this because in your cap table you have both. You have corporates and you have uh, private investors. We will arrive there soon. But uh, that reminds me to the common program, the TV show Shark Tank. How many of you have uh, seen any time Shark Tank? Either British or American version? Okay, a few. So that has happened also in Nestlé. So recently they have uh, launched a few initiatives connected with that. But I got impressed when I was researching yesterday before coming to this panel what Nestlé is doing all around the world from CVC, scouting, research and development. Would you mind, Sir, to give us kind of a, a, a perspective of all the, the, the mechanisms your company is doing? Sure. So as indicated, I'm from a small startup called Nestlé. And in the past, innovation was purely the kind of uh, task and uh, limited to the R&D unit in the company. Um, but as um, there's a lot of turbulation and uh, the external environment is changing, I would say today, innovation is the task of all of our employees. Now let me um, try to explain you or give a snapshot of how we do innovation um, at scale. So going beyond the core, uh, we have um, we either buy companies. So this is M&A, where uh, we really try to um, find a cultural fit and also to make sure that we leave these companies autonomous. Um, so we provide our expertise and we are in the back end to support them. In the past years, there were a couple of big M&As, um, Starbucks uh, deal, uh, Blue Bottle in the US and so on. Um, beyond uh, buying companies, we also build. That means we use the power of our employees. Uh, to crowdsource ideas and um, drive innovation from within. And the third pillar is partnership. And uh, super thrilled about the latest news that we are finally getting there to connect the dots and bring uh, together uh, under the R&D Accelerator uh, startups, our own employees and uh, universities and innovate together so, so one of the key takeaways that I get from this first round is this, that this collaboration is challenging. And we, just, we usually hear that, oh, corporate venture is corporate venture capital. However, as uh, we have described here, there are so many mechanisms now from scouting missions, hackathons, venture builders, uh, incubators, accelerators, and so on and so forth. But do you know that one, sorry, three-fourths 
of those collaborations fail? And let's start and trying to understand why those are failing. And let's start with the KPIs. So what are the challenges? And that goes for you. Uh, Daniel, where in your LinkedIn says, drive ASIC's future incremental growth and profit via new business initiatives. However, to measure this statement with KPIs sometimes is challenging. How do you measure innovation? What are the successful KPIs for innovation? What is the secret? So the secret, the secret sauce. And there's a lot of ingredients to it, obviously. Okay. Um, tell us, at, tell us. At, at the end, when you when you look at what we're doing at ASICs, uh, ASICs, and I always say it at all the at all the events. Uh, a lot of people don't know it. ASICs is an acronym which means Anima Sana in Corpore Sano. So a sound mind in a sound body. We started this off with a shoe. Everybody knows us for running brand. These are the guys from running, but actually we are the only, or one of the only brands who have the vision and mission statement like implicit in our brand name. So what we want to do, and this is uh, very much built into the founder's vision and mission of the company is, we want to make sure that ASICs provide the tools, products and services so people like you all in this room can live a happier and healthier life via sports. And we want to be the company who will be able to give this to the consumers, so to give the tools, service and products to do so. Uh, which means we in innovation want to work on the brand preference towards ASICs. So this some mind, some body philosophy uh, can be the top to mind point when a, a consumer thinks in the future of having a sports well-being life via physical activity and well-being. So long answer, how do we nail this and how do we make this uh, uh, into some KPIs. Obviously, you cannot measure this in, a, in one or two programs that we have been running right now, but obviously we want to drive this consumer preference in the future. We want to create new services. We want to create uh, new products. And then in a lifetime of three or uh, five years, you have some KPIs that are standing against it. So you have to see how much money do you invest in innovation and, and research development, and how does this ratio of money invested look to uh, when you compare it or put it into a relation with the additional revenue that you're taking out of these uh, initiatives. And then the same is not only it's revenue based, it also has to be sitting here. So how many additional dollars are you adding or, or euros are you adding um, to your growth uh, margin by these initiatives? Mm -hmm. And then there's obviously other factors to it. How you, do you drive then, uh, like uh, Esther said, how do you, do you uh, drive entrepreneurship and also drive the, the cultural change within a big corporate that innovation can be implemented and can be happening? So, so we have here business, new business models, new products, services, mindset, processes. There is one that uh, implicitly all of you have mentioned that this is speed. And I don't know whether Stir you agree or disagree with what he has said. What do you have to say about the speed? Uh, I remember that in a previous discussion with you, you mentioned how you internally, uh, your units are trying to speed up the processes of proof of concept, of working with the startups. Do you think that the speed is important? And if yes, how can we speed up processes collaborating with the startups? Okay, so it might be surprising what I'm saying, but speed is no longer really an issue for us. Um, past year, we were able to launch products in six to 10 months, uh, naming Kit Kat Ruby or other novels. Um, when it comes to a POC, we are able to um, do rapid prototyping in about 10 weeks time. So um, speed is crucial, but where uh, we more kind of find challenges is around finding the business ownership. So once we would like to hand over the concept um, in the um, ecosystem of Nestle, uh, there should be a home for it. And any secrets to get that ownership from business lines? How do you get the ownership from business lines? How do you convince them? Okay, so um, I think it's important that from early on we engage with these people. Uh, also, uh, capability building, uh, we are uh, trying to uh, put a lot of emphasis on that because until we don't speak the same language, 
people who do and drive innovation and people who are out there um, driving the business on the market level until we don't have a common understanding of innovation methodologies and so on is really difficult. So also we have different programs to rotate people and uh, send innovation people on the, into the business um, and, and also backwards, so have these like hybrid profiles. And if you guys, there are some people from other corporates here, I can totally recommend that uh, because then uh, it really helps to find a home for these in innovative concepts and um, not to have silos. But it's a long procedure. We have 300,000 employees, so you can imagine that there are silos still. Yeah, and this is a trend that we have seen on in, in our recent studies, how uh, to connect those we are, I mean, many corporates are using the three pockets rule. Do you know them? Do you know it? The one third, I mean, the cost of the next proof of concept, one third from the business line, one third from the innovation unit, one third from headquarters. So you increase the uh, budget you have available for the proof of concepts, but also in the other side, you have uh, easier buy-in from uh, the business units. But this is not only the, the, the one big challenge, Albert, I have prepared something really big for you, so get ready. Do you know in the audience, and we have released this, this data um, four days ago, more or less, around 21% of top resource centers worldwide are in Europe, but around 13, uh, around the three million patents that there are in Europe, 95% are dormant, and the remaining 5% generates 40% of the GDP of Europe. 40%, 40%. Do you imagine for a second to activate just one additional 5%? The why? If you check what's, and this is just an example, it's not the average, it's not this is just one example from the healthcare sector. If you are an investor, you have high cost, high risk, long term, 15 years. Are you interested to invest in that? And there is, as you can see here from the European Investment Bank, there is a lack of budget, a lack of funding, sorry, for there, for proof of concept. And then the question goes for you. You have come from, from a research center to the industry. You have done proof of concepts with universities. How can we solve this problem? The European Valley of Death. Wow, this is a key interesting topic. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, especially, I, my background is in physics, so I'm, come from, I'm coming from, you know, from you know, nerdy guys trying to you know, do crazy stuff, um, at sometimes not thinking on how you commercialize that, right? So that's me. Um, uh, I feel like, so the way we see it at FC Barcelona is research is investing money and generating knowledge, and open innovation strategies is transforming this knowledge into products and services that's going to be commercialized. So that's kind of the framework where we work with, right? And um, in our case, it's basically um, understanding what are the key topics uh, that we need to include into our research uh, line. Uh, and here, we tend to focus a lot on specific topics that we see that we are the, un the unique ones that are going to be pushing on that direction. And let me give you one example. Um, muscle and tendon injuries, right? So for us, it's kind of our cancer, right? So 50% uh, or even 60% of our injuries are from muscle and tendon injuries. So we are really interested in developing knowledge and potentially sometimes transforming this knowledge in a product and service that other clubs or other sports institutions may be using. But if we don't do that, probably no one in any health uh, other uh, institution will focus on that because probably for them um, it's not uh, from a you know from a market perspective it's not uh, as big as other pathologies, right? So we tend to um, again invest uh, money to develop this knowledge and the research uh, perspective. Then once. Um, from the open innovation perspective, um, and this is something that, again, it's something that the club has has been learning how to manage that in the last three years with Barca Innovation Hub because um, it's kind of uh, new on managing this knowledge and applying with third parties to develop jointly new products and services that are going to be sold to potential competitors on the pitch. So kind of uh, thinking a little bit beyond on what your, what your um, activity for 
next match and thinking on 10 years from now, right? Um, so this is kind of a, a, on our case is, uh, again, leveraging the productive capacity, the flexibility of the startups uh, together with our expertise, with our know-how to develop these products that's going to be sold um, to these potential uh, competitors uh, for tomorrow, but cooperators for 10 years from now. Um, if I go a little higher and I think of um, how, from, from a public policy perspective, Han start tackling this, one of the, in, in terms from, from, from European perspective, one of the key challenges is how we are able to um, have capital to invest uh, on those uh, initial stages of research um, and, and also in terms of a cultural um, kind of uh, thing. How, how, I mean, I have a lot of friends that has developed their PhDs but has never thought on building uh, their company. They are in the late 30s, uh, 40s, right? So they are all or academic professors or they just joined to corporate but to develop, uh, to be part of the, of the corporations. Probably next, the, the generations that are, that are growing right now, um, they have a, a different mindset. And I feel like it's because there has been a change on, on putting capital on help those uh, researchers. And from, a, I would say, even from a storytelling perspective, uh, they are excited about actually from what they're developing in the lab and try to think always on how this can be uh, built just um, from their um, from their day-to-day -day operations on the lab, right? So I would say, to summarize, let's try uh, to have a more flexible and more um, easy to gain uh, capital commitments from institutions and also changing this cultural um, way to understand research. Totally agree, and, and there is another challenge that we have identified in those collaborations that is IP, intellectual property. Please. The entrepreneurs that you have raised your hand before, tomorrow you're going to sit with an investor. What is one of the, of the words you have? Are they going to stall my, my, my intellectual property, my product, my, my design? Here we have a, an expert on intellectual property. What do you think that are the top two mistakes that entrepreneurs do when negotiating with corporates? And wonder what are the top two mistakes that corporates do when doing the same with the startups? Now, uh, so we see uh, counterfeiting and the piracy growing on a daily basis. We are expecting that uh, the, the counterfeiting reaches uh, about uh, like 4.2 trillions in few years online and offline. So one of the first mistakes that uh, it, when it, it comes about protecting your IP, the companies, startups, mainly startups, uh, make is not to protect their IP from the very beginning. Because in our case, what we do is protect companies and brands against this terrible issue, against counterfeiting and against piracy. But to do so, we need that the companies have registered their trademarks, their IP. Uh, so if you're starting a company, and uh, you want to sell online, or if you, even if you don't want to sell online, but it's a subject to be counterfeited, you better go and register your IP, your trademark, so when the problem comes, if it comes, um, because you have a very trendy product, or because, yes, it's become very popular, then you're protected, and uh, uh, companies like us can do our job and uh, fight for your trademark. So registration is one of the mistakes, non-registration, that young companies make. If I ask the same questions to the entrepreneurs in the room, I don't know what they are going to say, but we are going to do that, that, uh, that challenge. Before that, uh, and that is going to announce the, the next question for the audience, so you can start getting out your mobiles. Uh, what is, going, what is happening in corporate venture? And as you can see in this picture, uh, the number of companies uh, implementing those type of collaborations has multiplied by four. But not only th this, but also the investments done and the transactions done. But now, more and more, and you can uh, start entering into menti.com and using that code in your mobiles to ask for this question that is, now more and more, one of the key questions here is 
when, how, so let's start from the beginning. Before, all of you were startups and we were corporates. We can choose. Now, all of you are corporates and we are startups. We can choose. So if you're a corporate, what, tomorrow at 9 a.m., what are you going to offer to that startup? And now if you think in your main competitor what he or she is going to offer to that startup, but then the key question is what makes you unique? And for this comes this, this slide. What do you think, if you were in a startup, and even if you're in a startup or not right now, you can answer to this question. If you are in a startup, what would you want from a corporation? Either brand, technical industry, expertise, co-working space, financial resources, proof of concept, distribution channel, speed. Five seconds, okay. Only one person has answered, please. Someone else. Four people, okay, thank you. Six, seven, eight, thank you very much, audience. 9, 11, 13, 14. And this is interesting because sometimes when we are corporates, we are thinking, ah, I assume that the startup wants, and I say something. Or if I am a startup, I think that the corporate wants, but what they actually want, and you have it here. So interesting how, for instance, co-working spaces is down, and proof of concept and distribution channel is in the top. So I want to test my product. I want to test my business model. I want to sell. OK, interesting, 40, 41 people. We will share at the end the, the results of this, of, this, of, this, uh, of this one. But then the other question goes to here. If you were a corporation, imagine that you're a corporation right now, even if you're an entrepreneur, what would be your main challenge to adopt corporate venturing. If tomorrow you want to start doing all these great examples, venture builders, incubators, accelerators, CVC, tomorrow at 9 a.m., you want to start, what is going to be your main challenge? It's going to be the survival mindset that business units have, the internal politics with the executive committee, with other lines, the silos of information, the low levels of, of fit, uh, the buying from the top management, what is going to be? I'm happy to share very quickly what do you think, if uh, for all the panelists, what do you think uh, to, to synthesize? What do you think is currently the top challenge for adopting corporate venturing in one word? Each of you, a quick round. Only one word. What would be that word? Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. What more? Yeah, processes. Processes. What more? Communication. Communication, and from the startup perspective? I have no idea about corporate venture. So <laughs> uh, what I would say is, uh, well, they have to see the innovation, no, and understand, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know. Right, no right. So, so we have seen different topics that are included here. Here we see the internal politics as a top one, silos, survival mindset. So now that we are having only uh, three, more, three more minutes, I would like to, to, to finish this, uh, this discussion with two questions. My first question, I hope that we will have this panel next year even bigger with this great audience. What is going to change in the field of corporate venturing and growth from here to next year? What is your bid? What is going to change? What is going to happen in the, in the next year on corporate venturing? And you have each 15 seconds. What is going to happen? Understanding that uh, digital innovation is great, but corporations should think also on deep tech and how we relate to this step, di these deep tech uh, innovations that are ha harder to understand and harder to uh, I would say to uh, relate from a corporate standpoint, but understanding that this is the future 10 years from now and not just uh, the next three years. So deep tech is going to be a trend. What more? Um, so going a bit beyond corporate venturing in the food space, definitely uh, personalized nutrition, sustainability, and all of that um, um, yeah, surrounded by artificial intelligence. Sustainability and artificial intelligence. What more? So 
as we are seeing now, technology is everywhere. There's no digital transformation anymore. It's just technology. So every vertical, every sector has to adapt to technology. So what we're going to see is more corporates coming to invest in startups. And you know that now it's not only about technology, it's about food tech, prop tech, legal tech, and so tech, and sports tech, because now everything is tech. So corporates that are not investing, we're going to see them investing. More corporate venturing. One question to raise also in the long run, but in the short run is uh, what's about the ethics? So you, when you talk about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, who is going to teach the algorithms at the end? And which value set do we want uh, them to be taught? OK, and the last one, the last round, in 10 seconds, starting from you. If you think in the audience that you have in front of you, a recommendation that they can apply tomorrow at 9 AM, what is going to be that shot? And you have only 10 seconds. It's not for tomorrow for 9 AM. It's for right now. Use this event to network. Don't sit always with the same people. Maybe turn around right now. Look the person you have behind you right now. Make sure you meet them outside in the networking area and that you are creating and using this event to make meaningful connections, which will let you personally and your business grow. It was 12 seconds, but it's OK, no? OK. <laughs> Well, mine is very similar, but we, you can leave it until uh, 9 a.m. That is, go and look out for the ones who can help you. Uh, alone, you go somewhere together and with a team that uh, helps you to grow. You go much faster and, uh, and um, with, with less risk. Grow together. One more. All right. Uh, if you're a corporate, um, make sure that you have built uh, business intelligence to be able to detect uh, the emerging trends and act on that. If you're a startup, um, go beyond your uh, big idea and make sure you have a business model and a, um, a plan how to market it because that's a key when you want to work with corporates. Analytics for anticipation, what more? Uh, I would say two, be focused and be nice. Um, uh, prioritize your, your, you know, your fight but also understanding that amability is the best way to persuade people and is the best way to implement things. And the last thing we released today uh, for all you want uh, to, to go deeper on what we have discussed on corporate venturing, uh, deep tech, and so on and so forth, this new report that we have released uh, this week, uh, you can scan with the QR code uh, and you have access to a summary of, of what we have discussed. Please give a great applause for these amazing speakers and thank you very much.